All right. Hi, everybody. Thank you. All right. Let's see here. Ooh, I can't wait for this either. <laughs> so um, how many of you, just by a, a show of hands, have, um, in, in all of your badasseriness, uh, decapitated um, a uh, samurai warrior uh, from a moving horse? Show of hands. Yeah? Yeah? Uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. Maybe, maybe Tori, but, but I, I, I think you're all full of shit. All right. So um, that is, is one of the many things that I'm going to be talking about tonight, and thank God it comes up a lot. Um, when it comes to the, uh, the Onabugeisha, the Japanese warrior women, um, and, and it's important to note that there's a difference between samurai, which is a term referring only to men, and onobugeisha, which is the phrase for women, because in Japanese you need another phrase uh, for samurai women. Anyway, arguably the second most famous of these warrior women is the warrior queen Empress Jingu. She claimed the throne of her hu when her husband, uh, the Emperor Chuai, died around 200 AD. And uh, the following year, she invaded Korea. Uh, her skill as a warrior was such that uh, she completed her conquest of Korea while pregnant with the future next emperor. How many of you have done that? <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, her invasion was helped supposedly by a pair of divine jewels that she used to control the tides to allow the Japanese ships to... <laughs> Thank you to reach Korea. Um, the stories say that she was so skilled as a warrior that not a drop of blood was spilled and that she, uh, her son was born after several years of gestation. <laughs> I'm not a woman, but I can tell you that probably hurt. <laughs> All right. Um, and unfortunately, uh, at least for her, uh, she was removed from the official record as the 15th ruler of Japan um, and at nearly the same time, in 1881, was honored as the first woman ever featured on uh, a printed Japanese banknote, uh, a testament to the more egalitarian Shinto era of, an of ancient Japan, as opposed to the Neo-Confucius era that would happen around 800 AD. A thousand years later, the myth of the woman warrior would become a reality, albeit not a dominant one, and it would continue to appear throughout the country's medieval history up through... Mm, well, I'll let, you, I'll let you find that one out. Um, so before I talk about who those more recent Onobugeisha were, let's look at some of the challenges they faced and why they even existed in the first place. What circumstances would drive uh, a, a woman, uh, women were traditionally excluded from learning how to fight and wield weapons to take up arms against their oppressors in ancient Japan. Um, uh, Japanese women were expected to know at least a little bit of fighting for self-defense, as the following quote shows. Uh, they weren't really recognized for even that morsel of knowledge. Uh, British historian Stephen Turnbull, in his study of samurai, the samurai swordsman, points out that even Inazu Nitobe, the author of Bushido, the classic Japanese book on sword fighting, expresses both admiration and dismissal at the same time towards women fighters. And uh, as we see here, he says, uh, young girls, therefore, were trained to oppress their feelings, to in indurate their nerves, to manipulate weapons, especially the long sword called the naginata, so as, not, so as to be able to hold their own against unexpected odds. Yet the primary motive for exercise of this martial character was not for use in the field. It was twofold, personal and domestic. A woman owning no suzerain of her own formed her own bodyguard. Uh, with her weapon, she guarded her personal sanctity with as much zeal as her husband did his masters. The domestic utility of her warlike training was in the education of her sons. Yeah. Uh, and as with many cultural changes throughout the history of the world that have seen women claim a more equal footing to men than they had before, uh, the wives of the aristocratic samurai just didn't have a choice. Uh, when the men went off to war in service of their feudal lords and leaders, women were left to protect the homestead. And uh, Natobe adds uh, in, in Bushido, Japanese women had to be tough enough to kill themselves to protect their honor. Now, this is not an unfamiliar concept to us, as we have heard a lot about uh, seppuku, the, rep the uh, ritual killing uh, of oneself that a samurai warrior must go through. 
the women, I'm sure you'll be shocked to learn, had it worse. Girls, when they reach womanhood, were presented with kaiken, which might be directed to the bosom of their assailants, or if advisable to their own. Her one weapon was always in her bosom. It was a disgrace for her not to know the proper way in which she had to perpetrate self-destruction. For example, little as she was taught in anatomy, she must know the exact spot to cut in her throat. She must know how to tie her lower limbs together with a belt so that whatever the agonies of death might be, her corpse would be found in utmost modesty with the limbs properly composed. Ah, uh, right. Co you know, comparatively, seppuku, where you just disembowel yourself, is a lot easier. Um, so they just couldn't kill themselves. They had to be modest about it. In, uh, utterly, utterly intense. Uh, Onobugeisha were rarely encouraged to learn the tradition, to use the traditional katana uh, uh, sword, uh, although there were exceptions that I'll get into in a moment, there they were trained in the kaiken, the dagger, uh, a longer knife about uh, 6 to 12 inches in length called the tanto, and the bow and arrow. Most famously, uh, as I mentioned, they were trained in the naginata, which was a pole-armed sword that allowed the wielder to keep an attacker away from, from a long distance. Um, Onubageisha schools from the Edo period of uh, 1603 to 1868 emphasized the naginata, and the weapon became synonymous with uh, women warriors. And this brings us uh, to this lady uh, here, or there, wherever you're looking, um, Tomoe Gozen. And uh, she is the most famous of the Onubageisha, uh, who is described in the history books like so. She dexterously did handle sword and bow that she was a match for a thousand warriors and fit to meet God or devil. This warrior woman, so fierce as to be able to fight deities, uh, appears in the Heike Mono... Uh, Monogatari, the tale of the Heike, which uh, you can sort of think of as like the Japanese Iliad. Uh, although it's written in prose, not verse, it's also got multiple contributors prior to uh, 1330. Uh, and it recounts the five-year war between the Minamoto and Taira clans for control of Japan at the end of the 12th century, uh, the first major war between samurai clans. And it's, it's a remarkable document because it mentions so much in detail about how the war unfolded and also how the battles themselves were composed and who fought whom and who killed whom. Uh, it's almost biblical in, in the way that it dictates uh, 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 the, the unfolding of war. Um, the Heike w is interesting because for all of its detail, it, it only mentions Tomoe uh, in a few paragraphs. It, it, it describes her uh, as the servant mistress or, or possibly the warrior wife of Minamoto Kiso Yoshinaka. The text varies. Uh, she was a fearless writer, uh, it, it says, who had won matchless renown basically by kicking the shit out of the bravest captains who faced her. Um, kicking the shit is in the text. Thank you, thank you. Uh, her story in the Heike ends with Kiso's forces completely decimated. She's one, of the la she's one of the last seven warriors left on the losing side at the Battle of Awazu. Kiso tells her to run off as he's decided he wants to die, either by the hand of my enemy or mine own, and he would be shamed if he were to die alongside a woman, no matter how powerful her martial skills. Tomoe... Uh, as we've heard, uh, f you know, from other women uh, this evening, um, tells him to go get fucked. And, <laughs> and, and she wants him to, uh, to see how proud her warrior's death will be. And she waits with him. Uh, Ondo no Hachiro Moroshige of Musashi, a strong and valiant samurai, rides up with 30 followers almost immediately thereafter. I'm going to go a little bit over. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Tomoe heads straight for Onda, grapples with him, drags him from his horse, pushes his head against the pommel of her saddle while she's still on her horse, and cuts off his motherfucking head. Yeah. Now that's a major coup and honor in Japanese warrior culture, and it's an honor for, for the victor, anyway. Um, <laughs> Tomoe tries to escape, but is captured by Wada Yoshinori, who turns her into a concubine. She bears him a son. That son is killed when the entire Wada clan is wiped out about two decades later. After that, Tomoe becomes a nun and avoids both gods and devils until she turns 91. Um, and here's the kicker. Un just like Empress Jingu, there is no other historical evidence that Tomoe actually existed. 
Um, but Tomoe's inclusion in the Heike incl- ensures that she's going to have a place in the history books and the tale of the Ono Bugeisha endures. Um, her existence is unusual because she's the only Ono Bugeisha of the era to exist in an actual war account. There's even less detail on other wo- women warriors from that era. Uh, Hangaku Gozen. Uh, Gozen is, is a, um, uh, a, a formal term for a, a woman of high rank. Uh, Hangaku of the Joe family, a commander also renowned for her skill and beauty, who led 3,000 men to defend uh, t- uh, <laughs> hold on, uh, Toriskayama Castle uh, against 10,000 Kamakura warriors in 1201. Accounts differ, again. Uh, basically, she was wounded, impressed the hell out of the generals who were opposed to her, and one of them took her as a wife. Was it consensual? Was it coerced? We don't know. Uh, this is a this is a picture of Tomoe Gozen uh, decapitating a a, a a warrior on a horse. Um, it's important to to mention also uh, Hojo Masoko, the nun shogun. Uh, she was the wife of the first shogun Minamoto uh, Yoritomo. She defied her father's wishes to marry him, uh, basically running away and saying, "This one's mine." Um, and when he died in 1199, she took over. Uh, as per tradition, she entered the monastery after his death and relinquished none of her power. Uh, however, she also never raised a sword to defeat an enemy. She instead used her bully pulpit to force the samurai clan leaders to stand by the shogunate. Um, under the, uh, under the rule of law of her family, women actually had more rights uh, by law in Japan than they, than they had had since the uh, Shinto era. Women had equal rights of inheritance with their brothers, controlled household expenses, and were expected to raise their children in samurai ideals, um, such as contempt for death and unquestioning loyalty to their lord. Uh, and that's according to historian and martial artist Harry Cook. Uh, by the 17th century, women's roles had been reduced even further, however. Um, Cook notes that few that th- there were new words around this time for wife, uh, kanai and okusan, uh, which translate as uh, persons in the innermost recesses of the house. It's not a very nice way to talk about somebody that you're married to, uh, at least by modern standards. Um, and one book from the era on the kunoichi, the female ninja, described uh, their role, their main role. Uh, as espionage such as uh, eavesdropping on conversations, building a false sense of trust in targeted enemies, and finding service jobs in the homes of those enemies. Um, but no, uh, uh, not a lot of, uh, of uh, fighting on the field. At the same time, a cult of homosexuality had developed among some samurai men, and a book was published extolling the virtues of hot gay warrior sex. <laughs> Which I'm sure some of us are very uh, 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 enthusiastic about. But it also wrote, and, th- and this again, this is the important part, a woman is a creature of absolutely no importance. So, <laughs> who said yes? What, 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 you haven't had, oh, of course you did. Yeah, I know you're weird. All right. So, from then up until the Meiji Restoration of 1867, the history books often only mention women in order to note their matrimonial suicides. Um, yet at the end of the close of the samurai era, women warriors are again going to force themselves onto the Japanese consciousness, and this time for good, and this time we've got evidence. Um, they just wouldn't go without a fight. In 1868, the emperor was restored to power. Uh, as you might imagine, this did not sit well with the ruling shogunate, and uh, 3,000 samurai of the Aizu clan defended uh, Aizu Wakamatsu Castle in the north of Japan, against around 20,000 newly minted imperial soldiers. Um, You can think of this as Star Wars. (laughs) Around 3,000 men were uh, uh, were accompanied by 20 to 30 women who had received extensive training with the Naginata. Uh, uh, The British historian Turnbull calls them the most authentic women warriors in the whole of Japanese history. They were led by a woman named Nakano Takeko. They fought with swords against guns. Uh, how does that end? Bad. It ends very bad. Um, and it ends even worse this time. Uh, because of Jap- Japanese traditions concerning honor and defeat, many non-combatants killed themselves or had their warrior sisters and brothers kill them before facing death and battle themselves. Um, one wife of a magistrate that Turnbull uh, discovered cut her waist-length hair to shoulder length for the fight, a, a more masculine style, then decapitated her mother-in-law and daughter, something that we've probably all wanted to do. Um, (laughs) And then Turnbull writes, 
uh, quote, death in battle, Naginata in hand, drenched in blood, she sought. So when the Imperials realized they were facing women, they held their fire in order to capture them alive, probably to rape the hell out of them. Uh, led by Nakano, they, pres they pressed their advantage and they killed as many as they could. Nakano killed five or six before the Imperials took up their guns and shot her in the chest. And before dying, she convinced her sister, uh, Yuko, to decapitate her to avoid a, graceful, uh, to avoid a disgraceful capture. Um, and later, a shrine would be erected in her honor at a nearby temple. Uh, so, uh, why on earth am I talking about a history of women warriors that, for many of them, w probably didn't exist, may not have existed at all? Uh, Turnbull, in his survey of uh, the Onabugeisha called Samurai Women, 1184 to 1877, wrote about DNA testing on a battlefield remains uh, that, that, that involved around 105 bodies uh, from a battle in 1580. Uh, one third of those DNA belong to women. A quote from the same book sums it up. The archaeological evidence, meager though it is, tantalizingly suggests a wider female involvement in battle than is implied by written accounts alone. Can't always trust the book. So, for inspiring women to pick up their swords for two millennia, let's raise a glass to the Onobugeisha. Yeah. 